Welcome back everyone, I'm Jordan Giesegi, and this is The Limiting Factor. This is video number four of the magnesium series. Earlier in the series, I addressed the common concerns around magnesium like flammability and corrosion, and showed that there are new alloys available to address those concerns. I also showed that until recently, ultra-high quality thixomolded magnesium castings were limited to shot weights of just a few kilograms but that companies like Idra are now working towards castings that are 20 kilograms or larger, which opens the door to magnesium underbody castings that weigh up to a third less than aluminum castings, and thixomolded magnesium wheels that offer a 3 to 5 percent range improvement over cast aluminum wheels but cost less to manufacture. Thanks to the innovations happening with magnesium alloys and casting technology, I expect demand to surge for magnesium as the decade progresses to reduce the weight of electric vehicles. That's because removing mass from the vehicle reduces the size of the components required to move that mass around like the battery pack, motors, brakes, and suspension, which are all expensive. So reducing the vehicle weight through magnesium can be used to make electric vehicles cheaper, which is the primary goal of automakers this decade. The question is, where will the magnesium supply come from to meet that demand? Magnesium production is currently 1 60th the production of aluminum, which is its closest competitor. That means even a small shift towards magnesium by the automotive industry could quickly drive up prices and overwhelm supply chains. In my view, the best way to meet increasing demand for magnesium is by extracting it from seawater. That's because seawater is the largest and most widely available source of magnesium on the planet, containing about one pound of magnesium per 142 gallons, or 1.85 kilograms per 1 cubic meter. So today, I'm going to walk you through how Dow Chemical and Norsk Hydro dominated the magnesium market for over 50 years by using a seawater extraction process for magnesium, why that was eventually replaced by cheap and dirty magnesium from China, and Magrathea's plans to resurrect magnesium production from seawater and brines to provide the world with the first inherently carbon-neutral structural metal while producing it more cheaply than aluminum. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters, YouTube members, and Twitter subscribers, as well as Rebellionaire.com. They specialize in helping investors manage concentrated positions. Rebellionaire can help with covered calls, risk management, and creating a money master plan from your financial first principles. Let's start with a brief history of magnesium production. In the first video of the series, I showed that the first high-productivity modern process for producing magnesium was developed around World War I by Dow Chemical. That process was initially geared towards producing magnesium from brines in Michigan, where Dow Chemical was headquartered. Then, about 25 years later, World War II created a forcing function to rapidly scale production, and Dow adapted the process for extracting magnesium from brines to extracting magnesium from seawater. World War II also saw the invention and scaling of the pigeon process, which produces magnesium from sedimentary sources of magnesium carbonate. More on that later in the video. After World War II to the 1990s, most of the world's production of magnesium came from the Dow process. For example, on screen is the global production capacity for magnesium in 1970, which totaled about 287,000 tons per year. Of that 287 kilotons, 160 kilotons were produced by extracting magnesium from seawater, which was about 55% of global capacity. The two major players in the space were Dow Chemical in the United States at about 120 kilotons and Norsk Hydro in Norway at 40 kilotons. Although Norsk Hydro and Dow Chemical used different processes, they were both extracting magnesium from seawater using electrolytic processes, and they were both profitable for decades until the late 1990s and early 2000s. That's because in the 1990s, China began dominating the market with cheap, dirty magnesium produced using the pigeon process that was developed during World War II. 
That put most other companies in the magnesium industry out of business. The question is, why is that? Is it because the pigeon process is fundamentally more efficient than, for example, producing magnesium from seawater using the Dow process? Or was it something else, like the Chinese government putting their thumb on the scales in favor of their own manufacturers to push companies like Dow and Norsk Hydro out of the magnesium business? Let's first walk through the Dow process and then look at the pigeon process used in China. The basic steps for the Dow process were as follows. The first step was calcination. In calcination, oyster shells were dredged up from the Gulf of Mexico and heated to 1000 degrees Celsius, which created a calcium oxide powder. The second step of the process was precipitation of magnesium hydroxide, where the calcium oxide powder was mixed with seawater to create a magnesium hydroxide slurry, also known as milk of magnesia. The third step of the process was conversion, or neutralization, where the magnesium hydroxide was mixed with hydrochloric acid to create a magnesium chloride solution. The fourth step of the process was crystallization, where the magnesium chloride solution was then heated to evaporate the water, leaving magnesium chloride hydrate crystals. The fifth step of the process was electrolysis, where the magnesium chloride hydrate crystals were heated to their melting point, combined with salts, and electrolyzed to form pure magnesium metal that was cast into ingots and released chlorine gas. The sixth and final step was hydrochloric acid production production, where the chlorine gas was combined with hydrogen gas and recycled back into hydrochloric acid for the conversion and neutralization step. For me, the Dow process for extracting magnesium from seawater is captivating because it's cleaner than many other processes developed during America's industrialization, and it seems like it was so far ahead of its time, so much so that even now it seems like a futuristic and visionary idea. Willard Dow put it best when he said, There is an epic quality involved in taking a ladle of gleaming metal out of a curling, white-capped ocean wave. Not even the old alchemists and their wildest fancies ever got that far. Willard Dow was clearly immensely proud of the process and the advertising artwork that was commissioned to build hype around it during and after the war was epic. It was the pinnacle of American pride in industry and ingenuity. And as I've said in other videos, it's time we made a return to that, but with modern, lower cost, and even cleaner technology. As a side note, in my first video of the series, there were some comments indicating that extracting magnesium from the ocean would have an impact on marine life. That might be the case in a hyperlocal sense and to a small degree near the magnesium extraction plant, but overall it underestimates the absolute vastness of the ocean. I did some back-of-the-napkin math shown on screen, and in order to change the salinity of the ocean by six one-hundredths of a percent, we would have to increase the total global production of magnesium by a thousand times and maintain that extraction rate for a thousand years. That is, until we plan on building a Dyson Sphere, there's plenty of magnesium in the ocean for all potential future needs, and it won't have an impact on sea life. Now that we've covered the Dow process, let's move on to the pigeon process that's been used to produce most of the magnesium in China from the 1990s to today. Before the production of magnesium can even begin with the pigeon process, three precursor materials are required. The first two precursors are dolomite and coal. Dolomite is a similar mineral to limestone, but rather than just containing calcium carbonate, it also contains magnesium carbonate. China has an abundance of both dolomite and coal, and they're used raw in the pigeon production process, so they don't require further processing and are therefore low cost. The third precursor, ferrosilicon, does require additional processing. To make ferrosilicon, quartz, iron ore, and coal are mined, transported to the smelting plant, and then combined in an arc furnace at high temperature to produce the ferrosilicon. With the precursors in place, let's look at the pigeon process itself. The first step is calcination, where coal is again used, but this time to heat the dolomite to high temperatures to convert it from magnesium carbonate to magnesium oxide and carbon dioxide. 
The second step is to grind and mix the magnesium oxide with the ferrosilicon precursor and then form the mixture into briquettes or pellets. The third step is where the magnesium metal is produced through a reduction process. The briquettes of magnesium oxide and ferrosilicon are placed in a large metal tube called a retort, where they're heated and placed under vacuum. This causes the briquettes to release magnesium metal vapor that's cooled and condensed on the other side of the retort, where it solidifies into metal crystals. When the process is complete, the feed material that's left in the retort has turned to slag, or molten metal waste, and the magnesium crystals are stripped out of the retort by hand. Lastly, the magnesium crystals are remelted and then refined by adding some salt and skimming impurities off the top of the molten metal. Then, the molten metal is poured into molds to form the ingots. Now that we've looked at the Dow process versus the Pigeon process, let's do some analysis to compare the two. First, with the Dow process, most of the raw materials that were needed were adjacent to the plant in the ocean. That's as opposed to the pigeon process where the raw materials have to be mined, refined, and shipped hundreds of kilometers overland to the processing plant. Second, on that note, if not done competently, mining is the most destructive and disruptive industrial process. Millions of tons of earth are moved, destroying ecosystems and often releasing toxic or aggravating compounds into the air, soil, and water. Third, for each kilogram of magnesium produced with the pigeon process, about 10 kilograms of coal is burned, so it releases large amounts of carbon dioxide. And that doesn't include the carbon dioxide that's released as a byproduct of the calcination reaction. Fourth, the pigeon process isn't a continuous chemical process. The retorts have to be filled, heated, cooled, scraped out by hand, and then the process repeated. And after a couple of hundred process cycles, the retorts have to be replaced. That's as opposed to the Dow process, which is mainly done with pumps and conveyor belts. So for the most part, the materials are always simultaneously moving and being processed, which is typically more efficient and requires significantly less human labor. If the pigeon process is so dirty and inefficient, then why did China choose that process and how were they able to produce magnesium so cheaply with that process to drive most everyone else out of business? First, China has an abundance of dolomite, coal, iron ore, and silicon that can be produced at low cost thanks to low-cost labor, equipment, and energy. Furthermore, all of those raw materials are either directly or indirectly subsidized by China, which in turn subsidizes magnesium production. Coal plays an especially large role because it's the most heavily subsidized of the raw materials and because the pigeon process uses a lot of it. Second, on that note, over the last few decades, China as a country was willing to accept the negative impacts of environmentally destructive processes. That's because for the Chinese Communist Party, for many years, the options were to stagnate economically and face revolt, or grow at all costs and deal with the consequences later. That is, China made deliberate environmental sacrifices with very real human costs that didn't show up in the price of magnesium. Third, despite seawater processes being fundamentally more efficient in terms of the complexity of their supply chains, energy intensity, vertical integration, and the transport of raw materials, they did contain inefficiencies. But for Dow and Norsk Hydro to address those inefficiencies and improve their competitiveness, it would have taken years of R&D and billions in investment which, without government support or subsidies, wasn't going to happen in the face of a tidal wave of highly subsidized Chinese magnesium. The end result of the subsidies, acceptance of the environmental impacts, and the lack of innovation in the seawater processes were that Chinese magnesium had much lower production costs than Dow and Norsk Hydro, making it difficult to remain profitable. What all this means is that the primary reason why Western production of magnesium from Dow and Norsk Hydro was shuttered in the 1990s and early 2000s wasn't due to any fundamental disadvantages of using an electrolytic seawater-based process versus the pigeon process, but rather that the Chinese Communist Party had a clear agenda to build their own magnesium industry at all costs and wipe out Western competition.
Meanwhile, Western governments didn't do enough to help companies like Norsk Hydro and Dow compete. The result was that China now has a near monopoly on magnesium, producing about 87% of global output, and there's almost zero significant primary production of magnesium in all of NATO and the Western world. However, in my view, the tide is about to turn for three reasons. First, American and European companies are reshoring their supply chains and or using China Plus One strategies that diversify their supply chains away from China to other countries. And that's for all the reasons you'd expect. For example, the supply chain shocks created by COVID that left companies starting to prioritize supply chain security over cost and the geopolitical tension that's occurring between the U.S. and China. Second, the changing economics within China. For example, between 2010 and 2020, wages in China more than doubled. As I said earlier, magnesium production with the pigeon process is labor-intensive because, among other things, the magnesium is stripped out of the retort by hand, which has and will continue to increase the cost of magnesium production in China. Third, U.S. government intervention. Besides the corporate strategies to reshore and diversify supply chains, the U.S. government has been taking actions to rebuild manufacturing in the U.S. One example of many is the Advanced Manufacturing Production Tax Credit in the Inflation Reduction Act, which provides a 10% tax credit to produce critical minerals in the U.S., and magnesium is on the list. Hopefully, the combination of changing corporate priorities due to geopolitics, the increasing cost of production in China, and the actions the U.S. government is taking to rebuild U.S. manufacturing will kick off a magnesium scaling and innovation boom that reinstates the U.S. as the largest producer of magnesium in the world. If that happened, it could drive down the price of magnesium to the point where it's at parity or even cheaper than aluminum, which would mean cheaper and and lighter weight vehicles. With that in mind, let's look at Magrathea's process for producing magnesium from seawater. First, it's worth noting that Magrathea is a startup, and generally I avoid covering startups. That's because I prefer to work from patents, public or private research, and or teardowns to look at exactly how a technology works. Startups, on the other hand, are often promoting a technology that's at a lower technology readiness level where you have to rely more on marketing hype, or the technology hasn't reached large-scale manufacturing, which is often the hardest part of commercialization. That means it may not even be worth covering the technology because it hasn't had any real impact on consumers and the odds of failing are 10 to 1. With Magrathea, I'm making an exception because they're basing their processes off of the processes used for decades by Dow Chemical and Norsk Hydro. Those processes were profitable and may have continued to be profitable if it weren't for the market distortions created by Chinese magnesium. So, although Magrathea hasn't yet published information on the technical details of how they're improving the process of extracting magnesium from seawater, I don't view Magrathea as a typical pie-in-the-sky startup. That's because they're working from an established technology base from Dow and Norsk Hydro, keeping and overhauling the parts that were inefficient, but introducing new technology to the core of the process to create a step change in efficiency. Let's use the Dow process as the baseline and take a look at Magrathea's general strategy. Note that most of the information I'm about to provide came from interviews of Alex Krant, Magrathea's CEO. However, I've known Alex for years and even interviewed him, and he was able to clarify some points for this video. First, rather than using oyster shells, Magrathea intends to use electrochemical techniques to extract the magnesium more directly from the seawater. That would mean they wouldn't have to dredge up tons of oyster shells, heat them, and then add them to seawater to precipitate out the magnesium. If that's the case, it would mean the first two steps, calcination and precipitation, could become one electrochemical extraction step. Second, Magrathea claims their core technology innovation is a new approach for the processing of the magnesium salt before it gets electrolyzed into metal. I'm assuming what they're referring to here is the conversion and crystallization steps, but they haven't yet given any hints as to what that core technology innovation is. I'm guessing 
guessing that whatever that innovation is, that it'll reduce the amount of hydrochloric acid used compared to the Dow process. Third, at the molten electrolysis stage, the Dow process required a lot of labor to keep the equipment clean. Magrathia's process is much less labor-intensive, and they've also found ways to make the electrolytic cells last longer than the electrolytic cells used by Dow. Fourth, also at the molten electrolysis stage, Magrathia has found ways to reduce total energy usage. For example, their molten electrolysis process has about 100 degrees Celsius of headroom, which means there's a 100 degree temperature range where they can produce magnesium. That, in turn, means they can adjust the temperature and speed of the process when electricity rates are higher or lower to make it more cost efficient. Fifth, molten electrolysis is energy intensive. Magrathia can reduce their electricity costs and the CO2 emissions of their magnesium by investing in their own solar and wind farms and grid-scale battery storage solutions. Those power sources are now some of the cheapest options on the market, and by the time Magrathia starts building full-scale magnesium plants, those renewable energy options will be even cheaper. So where does Magrathia currently stand, and what are their production plans? As with the process information, there isn't detailed information available publicly at this point because Magrathia is still privately held. But what I do know is that Magrathia is currently setting up a low-volume pilot in California, which is nearly complete, and their long-term goal in the next 5 to 10 years is to become one of the largest producers of magnesium in the world. In my view, that means progressing from a low-volume pilot plant to a demonstration-scale plant in the next few years, then to a full-scale commercial plant by the end of the decade. However, that's just a guess on my part, and I'm looking forward to more information in the years to come. For example, if they go public and or publish patents, then I can provide more in-depth information and analysis. In summary, for several decades, seawater was the primary source for global magnesium production. Looking back, Dow Chemical's massive plant in the Gulf of Mexico was ahead of its time, and a gem of American ingenuity. It produced huge amounts of relatively clean magnesium from raw materials that were available in abundance on site, and it didn't require any mining. The only reason why magnesium production from seawater by Dow and Norsk Hydro shut down was because the Chinese Communist Party heavily subsidized their own domestic magnesium production from the early 1990s onwards. Those Chinese producers dumped their low-cost magnesium on Western markets, which soon put Dow and Norsk Hydro out of business. Now the tide is turning. Outside of China, the world is shifting away from the global perspective of the last few decades that emphasized offshoring to reduce costs to a stance that emphasizes supply chain security, trade with allies, and strong industrial policies. Furthermore, inside of China, among other factors, the cost of producing magnesium is increasing because the pigeon process is labor-intensive and wages are rising. Those global and local factors mean that we may see a revival of magnesium production in America and Europe. Magrathia is in an excellent position to lead that revival by resurrecting and improving upon the electrolytic processes used by Dow and Norsk Hydro. If they're successful, they should be able to dramatically reduce the cost of production for magnesium to at or below the cost of aluminum. If that happens, magnesium will begin to displace aluminum as the primary structural metal for lightweight applications, which is a vast opportunity. As a final note, for the icing on the cake, Magrathia plans to make their magnesium the first structural metal that's inherently carbon neutral. The Dow process was a relatively clean process, but by simplifying that process and shifting to renewable energy, Magrathia could give us the sci-fi ideal of clean, cheap, and abundant lightweight structural metal. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting the channel by using the links in the description. Also, consider following me on X. I often use X as a testbed for sharing ideas, and X subscribers like my Patreon supporters generally get access to my videos a week early. On that note, a special thanks to my YouTube members, X subscribers, and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.